about the bone physiology, what's going on in bones that makes this happen. There are two, there's a, a metabolism of bones. There are osteoblasts, the osteocytes that make bone, building up walls of bones throughout your body. And then there are the osteoclasts that are dissolving the bone and sending it back to the systemic circulation. Here is a picture, here is a picture of a bone in general with all of the necessary elements present. The circle is around an osteoblast, which lines the edge of the bone and is waiting for some stimulus. Uh, the minute it gets stimulus, it will start, as the second oval indicates, going into the bone. It won't stay on the surface. It will actually make its way inward. What's happening there? What's happening is something Ellen will go into again because it's important. When a, a bone cell, an osteocyte, is stimulated, when something mechanically touches it, it's called mechanotransduction. It's a critical process in all life, from a simple amoeba onward. Something presses against the outside of the cell membrane, and it, it, the energy of that pressure is magically transformed by that amazing cell membrane into an electron volt, which powers a, a, a chemical reaction on the inside of the cell membrane and changes one molecule's form. And then it wafts its way down to the nucleus, where it actually uplifts certain DNA, certain number of our genes, that were previously not really useful and downgrade some others so that the new DNA makes RNA, makes proteins, and those proteins after that white arrow there make the little spicules that are extruded from the cell and form the matrix of bone. That's the magic. That could be a cell that's elongated, pressed, twisted, compressed, you name it. This is the cell's reaction. Well, as it secretes bone, it makes its way into the bone, basically by surrounding itself with its own secretions. Then there's the bone cell right in the middle of the bone. You might think it's out of touch. Now, is that happening to these cells? Absolutely not. Those cells, look in the lower left-hand corner, are connected by long, skinny tendrils. It's like a conga line. There can be 10 or 15 of them in a row, connecting to the Herisian canal, where that triangle of bone comes to its apex where there's a blood vessel, where oxygen and glucose and those hormones necessary for growth are given to the first cell, which then, like Portuguese man of wars, emit through their tentacles those products to the next cell and the next and the next. Those osteocytes, if you look in the lower left corner, are actually connected to each other. They're individual cells, but they're connected. They've got brothers. In a whole uh, body of a, of a bone, there are those cells and lines. You can see where those sort of canals are. Well, why the cells aren't connected to the canals? If they were, the bone would be too weak to survive the merest of our activities. So these little cells cooperate with each other. They're never on mute. They're always talking to each other. So how does, that's how the bone physiology works. Now, uh, what happens with those osteoclasts? What about the cells that destroy bone? What are they there for? Well, here they are. Here's one that I've got a picture of. And uh, here's another picture. And they sort of look like the you see that movie, uh, Independence Day? They sort of look like those large, gruesome spaceships that are down, down to destroy things. You should have a lot of respect for them with their 50 nuclei. These giant cells are capable of destroying bone. That very bone that survives thousands of years in catacombs, wind and weather and everything else, these little cells can do it. And they do. Why are they there? They're there to dissolve the calcium and the protein and send them back into the bloodstream in order to make new cells. Does that sound like a terrible thing? To some, it does. It's actually an absolutely necessary thing. It's because, unlike the old song, the thigh bone is connected to the bloodstream. Because the calcium in the body has to maintain very tight limits, or else you go into spasm. You go into a sort of uh, tightness that is inconsistent with life. I mean, the heart is a muscle. But the thigh bone is also connected to the clock. If you look at two people with exactly the same bone density, with the two red circles there, you see that there's a 22 times greater risk of fracture at age 85 than 50, even with exactly the same bone density. Why is that? Well, now we're talking falls. There is a sort of balance between the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. And until you reach the age of about 30, the osteoblasts are in, are in command and they have a much greater activity. When you reach that age, things abruptly change, and the yin-yang turns, turns the other way, and the osteoclasts have a much more important role. So you're absorbing more bone than you're making, with obvious consequences. 
the osteoblasts are working, your bone density goes up in the opposite way they're on in life. If you have little exercise, then you follow that lowest red line on slide 37. You reach the limit of osteopenia and osteoporosis very early in life. But if you are normal, it's later, and if you exercise a lot, you have a much higher bone density from which you descend. All three of those curves are basically parallel after the fifth decade. That means if you build up more bone density, you're going to have a lot longer to go before you're below any limit and close to any danger. This is why we advocate yoga for children. The same, in the medieval times, they even recognized this, as you can see, that woman down in the lower right, sitting down there on the stairs with her hunchback, wondering what those young people are doing up there. The same thing will happen to each one of us, man, woman, or child, as we get older, unless we do something about it. On the left side, you see what happens to the, the, the vertebral bodies as time goes on, urging you, requiring you to go into that bent posture if you don't do something about it. So in youth, the osteocytes and the osteoblasts predominate, and when you get over 40, the osteoclasts take over. So the question is, what can we do about it now? What can we do? Well. The medications do some things. They shift the balance by suppressing the cells that are eating up the bone. Sensible enough, you're making just as much and you start destroying. Here, look on the right. See those osteoclasts? Gosh, they get their less of them, they're smaller, and they're working slower. So they're dissolving the bone more slowly while the osteoblasts and osteocytes are making it at the same rate. Hey, isn't that good? We're going to have more bone than we had before, aren't we? Like more income and less expenditure. That's not got to be good, doesn't it? Answer, I don't think so. Here's why. Look at that little cell in the middle. That little cell needs bodies around to give them more uh, food and to, to give them more oxygen and to carry away the products of metabolism. If there are cells that are dying, something has to come around and eat out those damaged, diseased, or dead cells. Take them away so new ones can form, so the Congo lines can be complete. If that cell doesn't get enough of what it needs because another cell's in trouble, then that cell will get in trouble. Pretty soon, whole sheets of cells will be in trouble. And as they're in trouble, no, nothing will come around. No janitorial function will be performed. This metabolism, this give and take, is critical to the further existence of the bones themselves. And it can be proven by the side effects of the medications. And they are osteonecrosis, where part of the bone, according to exactly what we've just been explaining, dies. It doesn't get adequate nutrition or, or the adequate removal of its metabolic products. This happens most commonly in the jaw, and it's not that common. But I've also seen already two cases in the knee, and that requires surgery that you don't really want. And then secondly, there was the spontaneous fractures. A woman, a doctor going to NYU on the subway in New York, fell, and her hip was broken. She said, I fell and broke my hip. And because she was on the subway, there were lots of witnesses who said, no, no, doctor. You broke your hip and fell. These sheets of cells that had died no longer supported her, and the hip simply gave way. There are now hundreds of cases of this. Third, the, these medicines, the uh, bisphosphonates, once they're in your body, they never leave. They're there long after you're gone. And uh, when you do have a fracture, for whatever reason, your healing is often retarded. Fourth, and I think everybody pretty well knows this, they're not really good for your stomach. You can't eat for an hour afterwards. There are many, many, many people who cannot take these because of the awful things they do to the digestive tract. And fifth, there are studies in New Zealand that it's sort of corroborated by American studies that we're actually aiming at something else, that you get atrial fibrillation from this. Uh, there's an increased incidence of atrial fibrillation with any of the bisphosphonates, not just uh, Fosamax, but all the rest of them too. You know, Boniva and uh, Zoledronic acid and all of them. So. Beware. That's what I say. Beware.